she is like the every girl. She is everyone's sister or daughter or friend and an amazing human being that is gone and we still don't really know why. This case that we're going to go over right now is both bizarre and disturbing. It's one of those cases that I first read about and was following in the news. And I was like, what happened to her? They did what? They, di they, didn't, they didn't do that, did they? This case is one of those. It's very strange. And it's the case of Mitrice Richardson. So Mitrice Richardson went to the same college as I did, Cal State Fullerton. She had just graduated and she was going to become a psychologist. She was going to be a doctor. And then one night, something goes terribly wrong. And she is arrested at a Malibu restaurant because she couldn't pay her bill. And we're going to get into that in a little bit, too. But she's taken to a sheriff's substation up in Malibu. And there's really nothing around. And it's in the middle of the night when she's released with none of her belongings. No cell phone, no money, no wallet, no keys, no car. And then she disappears without a trace. Or at least we think. Her family doesn't think so. They think that someone knows something and is not sharing the details in this case. They think she was murdered. And they open up about the story and what they think can crack this case wide open. We're going to be talking about Mitrice Richardson. Buckle up, investigators. You're on Deadline. From the Hollywood Hills to your ear holes, this is True Crime Deadline. A podcast discussing cold cases, murder mysteries, and completely random thoughts. Now, here's your host, a man who stands in front of crime scene tape and talks on the TV box for a living, Mr. Mystery himself, Matt Johnson. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in for episode four of True Crime Deadline. I'm Matt Johnson, and the case that we're going to go over today is one that is really disturbing. I mentioned that. It's about Mitrice Richardson. It's not a case that I personally covered, but it's a case that I definitely followed because Mitrice is from the same area that I grew up in, and we both attended the same college, Cal State Fullerton. So she gets a degree in psychology and in 2009, she's very excited to go out into the world. She is about ready to go into grad school. She's putting herself through school. She has a girlfriend. She has a relationship. Things are looking up. She's a happy person. So to help pay for school, she does a couple side modeling gigs. One over at the Playboy Mansion. And then she also does a couple beauty pageants to help bring in money that way. Including this one, where she's recorded and she's talking about technology and how it's changed society. It's kind of ironic and a little sad to listen to because when you think about it, that night that she goes missing, all she really needed was a cell phone. Matrice is sponsored by the Fullerton Fire Association. What one technological advancement do you wish had never been invented? Cell phones. Uh, <laughs> although when you're stranded, they help contact your family and the need of a spare tire or just in any need of emergency. But they also cause a lot of accidents and they cause a lot of friendships from forming because as soon as people get out of class, the first thing they want to do is talk on their cell phones. So I just wish that cell phones would be limited to just emergencies only. Thank you. In this video, my tree smiling from ear to ear, very kind person. And that's exactly how everyone describes her to me. They say that she was not only a loving person, friendly, but she had a heart of gold and probably a little bit naive. That's just the best way to capture her. You know, just one of those, she'd give you the shirt off her back. She'd bend over backwards, you know, to help anyone. That's Dr. Rhonda Hampton, Mitrice's mentor and her friend. So what's going on around her life at the time where she disappears? So um, at the time that she disappeared, she, um, so she graduated and um, was really trying to figure out how she was going to pay for graduate school. And so she had decided that she was going to get her, uh, you know, uh, certifications that she needed to substitute teach. Um, and then she thought also that she would be able to um, maybe teach some dance classes um, on the side. Um, just kind of to work her way through grad school. So she was kind of spending that year um, getting those certifications. 
also learning hip hop because one of the, one of the things that she complained. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So she was, you know, more classically trained dancer, and so she would say, like, um, Doctor Rhonda, I'm I'm hip hop impaired. So um, <laughs> so she spent some time learning hip hop, and um, and her and I were just getting ready to have lunch. Um, to kind of go over some grad school applications right before she, I think, it, I think, so if she went missing on that Thursday, I think we had planned on meeting that Tuesday or something like that. The two would never have that lunch together because on September 16th, 2009, Maitrice has some sort of episode. She says that she's from Mars. She's telling people that she's going to vindicate Michael Jackson and she ends up driving herself down the Malibu coast and ends up at Joffrey's restaurant, where inside she has dinner with strangers, she has a drink, and then despite the fact that she has money, she's unable to function and unable to pay. So what do they do? They call the cops. Lawful Sheriff Station, Deputy Shalef, I can help you. Hi, I'm calling from Joffrey's restaurant in Malibu. Um, We have a guest here who is refusing to pay her bill, and we think she may, she sounds really crazy, she may be on drugs or something. Um, We are wondering if someone could come by and pick her up. So deputies with L.A. County Sheriff's Office come out to the restaurant and give Maitrice a field sobriety test, which she passes. They determine that she's not intoxicated, but she's still arrested on suspicion of not being able to pay for a meal and possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. She's taken to the Malibu Lost Hills Station, and her car, along with her purse, her keys, her phone, wallet inside that car is towed. I am calling. I'm a little frazzled right now. I understand my daughter is being brought into the station. My Therese Richardson has made it to the station yet, and she's been booked. Okay. Do you know where she's coming from? Uh, It's some restaurant out in Malibu, and I I didn't even think to get the name. The manager's name is... The only place we have somebody that's in custody that they just announced on the radio that they're coming up is from Joffrey's. In the typical highway, it's okay. the only female that's being brought up to the station as we speak. They actually just put it on the radio right before you called. Okay, okay. I'm I'm her mother, oh, okay. and are you guys going to book her and then release her on her own re- recognizant tonight because it, it, it's dark, she doesn't have a car, and I don't want her wandering out. I'm I'm totally just taken aback because this is so out of character for her. Yeah. And you'll see when she comes in, she she's well spoken. I think the only way I will come and get her tonight is if you guys are going to release her tonight. If if she's going to be held in custody for some type of arraignment tomorrow, Mm -hmm. then I will wait until tomorrow. She definitely has no place, you know, I mean, she's not from that area, and I would hate to (laughs) wake up to a morning report, girl, lost somewhere with her head chopped off, Uh so I guess I would have to come and get her. Oh, my God. Yeah, we're in a great house. The only thing is, at least in the station here, she will be separated, so nobody's going to be with her. Uh, so at least that's, you know, the plus thing, so you don't have to worry about her safety. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I feel safe with her being yeah. in, in custody. It's being released, but I'm worried about it. It's crazy out here. Now, despite promises from deputies at the station when Latisse calls about her daughter, they say that they're not going to be releasing Maitrice until later that morning. However, she's released in the middle of the night in the darkness. Rockville Station, Baumgartner. Yes, hi. My name is Latisse Batten. I called not too long ago regarding my daughter, Maitrice Richardson. How long before a missing persons report can be filed? Is it 24 or 48 hours? That's long. Well, it depends on the circumstances, but uh, um, I, I didn't take your call, so I'm not familiar with it. Did she just not return home after going out? She was arrested last night. This is the first time she's been arrested. Um, she's in an unknown area mm-hmm. that she's never been in. She's without a vehicle. Nobody can find her. And, and where was this at? Where was she arrested at? Your your facility. Her name is Maitrice Richardson. Okay. Do Do you know if she's if she's here now or was she released? They said she was released. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what time was she released? Um, at, at just shortly after 12 a.m. Maitrice's mom now starting to get panicked. You can hear it in her voice. Something, so, so, something is obviously going on with her. Have you she talked to the jailer? And yes, 
Yes, yes, yes, I have. He said he tried to get her to stay, but because she was an adult, they had to let her go. Well, um, I think she's suppressed. That's what has me to that what, fight. That's worried that. you more than just her, mm-hmm. okay. That and the fact that she's in an area where she doesn't know where she's at. Yeah, does so. she take medication at all? No, she. I, I I believe it's a state that she's in right now because of just the the weird activity that's been going on. What, what's your name? Day. What's your her name? name is, her name is Maitrice okay. Richardson. Maitrice's mom, Rhonda, and a few other family and friends, they know that something's not right. And so they start searching right away. However, they don't know what direction in Malibu she went, where they should start their search. What would have been helpful is if they were told about this phone call. Hello, Sheriff Station Office, can I help you? Yeah, hi. Hey, uh, this is uh, uh, Smith at Cold Canyon. We had a prowler walking around through the backyard here, but we don't know what the situation was. I uh, don't know if you have a unit in the area. It might do a little drive-by or something. Okay, where is this at? This is Cold Canyon, like hot and cold in Mali Nido. Um, but it's in the back of the house, uh, which is right where Wood Bluff hits the hits uh, Cold Canyon. Uh, and we just had a strange woman walking through the backyard here. It's a fairly large property, and she was sitting on the steps right, right in the back of the house here. Uh, this is kind of a circular driveway, and the gates were closed, so we don't know where this woman came from. You said the cross was Wood Bluff? Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's there's a, a horse trail, ac- hiking trail access through here, but we've never had this kind of happen, thing happen before. <laughs> what she look like? White, black, Hispanic? Uh, uh, you know, a tall, slim, black woman with Afro hair. About how tall? Uh, well, well, she was sitting down, stretched out on the wooden steps in the back of the house. Hard to tell, but uh, she looked like she might have been medium to slightly tall. Uh, with a big Afro hair, very skinny. And I think she was wearing maybe jeans or tight pants with a T-shirt. And what direction was she, did she last seen? Heading? Never saw her. She, well, once she left, she just disappeared. At the same time, you know, the, the L.A. sheriffs were saying that they were doing searches of her, but they weren't. Um, we didn't know, for example, for a while that she was actually seen in the backyard of Bill Smith. They withheld that information. Um, and, and, and then when we find out that she was in that backyard, we were like, well, why aren't you searching Montanito? And if you're using dogs, why aren't the dogs starting at the sheriff's station to find out if she jumped in the car? So there was never a search from the sheriff's station to see which which direction she walked. Um, because of that, we were wanting to see the video. Well, if they didn't know what direction she, she walked, then at least show us, let us see the video so we could see decide where we're going to start our, our search. You know, When you walk out of the station, you go left or right. We don't know which way she walked. Um, they refused to provide a video. No, well, not only did they refuse, they said that a video did not exist. So th- they were just stonewalling the entire way. And they would get pissed off when we, when we were doing um, searches. When did it become a national search? So after the search happened, it was supposed to be a two-day search, but it was only a one-day search, right? And so when they called off the search for the second day, we all got very, very desperate. And I honestly start calling everybody that I could. I mean, Al Sharpton, you know, Jesse Jackson, like making all those phone calls on a, on a Sunday. And I, I eventually uh, called um, Gloria Allred's office um, and basically was told that she had no interest in, you know, picking up that story. Um, and, and But the gentleman who, who talked to me, you know, told me to call KFI. And, and I called KFI, the John and Ken show. And I remember the producer, I think was Michelle Cube, basically basically indicating that if I could get on the Johnny Kin show, then it would make national attention, uh, get some national attention. And that's exactly what happened. So after Latisse and I actually were on the show and, and then it began to get national coverage. Maitrice was arrested in September for not paying an $89 tab at a swanky Malibu restaurant. Police released her from a remote substation in the middle of the night with no car, no purse, no money, and no phone. She just disappeared. And then when it's getting this national coverage and when you're being on all of these TV shows or radio shows talking about your friend who's missing, what is that like? I would imagine it's kind of an out-of-body experience. Like, what is that like for you? You know, and it's it's it, that that's a good way to describe it. It was all very uh, um, sort of surreal, 
Um, and it really was an out of body experience because at the same time we're having to put the word out, you know, that she's missing, we're also doing searches and arranging for, you know, people to come and help us search in areas that we just were not familiar with. And also, you know, I'm I'm a law abiding citizen, so also in the middle of all this, realizing that we're up against one of the most powerful um sheriff stations, you know, in the United States. So, you know, and feeling very intimidated and bullied by them, it, all, having to deal with that all at the same time was very emotionally draining and overwhelming. Why are you feeling that way, I guess? Um, you know, because what is going on during that time? Are they not helping? Are they not cooperating? Are they not telling you what happened to my trees? What, what's going on? Why do you feel that way? So the only so what happened was the only way that we really found out information um, is with the LAPD detective Christian Merrill. Right before we went on the John and Ken show, she called us and she gave us every bit of information that she could about my Teresa's behavior in um, you know inside the restaurant and proceeded to tell us after she hung up she would never be allowed to t- to speak to us again and she never has so luckily she gave us enough information about her behavior that we were able to really um provide more detail to the radio program but same time you know the the LA sheriffs were saying that they were doing searches of her but they weren't days turn into weeks weeks turn into months and then it's 11 months later and my Teresa's remains are found in a very strange place, in a remote creek bed, right next to a porn ranch of all places, and there's an illegal marijuana grow nearby. Sad ending to a strange story that began nearly a year ago. Those skeletal remains found in Malibu Canyon earlier this week have been identified as Mitrice Richardson. Park rangers found the remains last Monday in an extremely remote location nearly 10 miles from the substation off Payuma Road. The fact that she was found where she was found, so far away from where she was allegedly released. Melissa Morgan is a true crime podcast host. Uh, She hosts the podcast Just the Tipsters. Awesome name. And she has researched this case extensively. Even though it's been, gosh, almost 10 years now, coming up on 10 years, it is still the most fascinating case for me in Los Angeles County. Because even though it was I don't know if it's considered a closed case, probably. I don't feel like it's closed. It's it's still open. There's still way too many questions, way too many things that happen that are unexplainable. And she is like the every girl. She is everyone's sister or daughter or friend and an amazing human being that is gone and we still don't really know why. So what, uh, how did you run across um, the case of Mitrice? Um, today's her birthday, by the way. Um, wow. I know. Um, so how did you run across her case and then what intrigued you about it? So it's been a fascinating case for me because of the amount of question marks that are at, at the end of her story. And I don't want that to be for her family and her loved ones. I want those question marks to be erased and answers to be given. What are, um, I know that there's a lot of red herrings with this case, you know, which is just so fascinating. The more you look at it and the more you talk to people, the more you're like, what? Um, But what are the major ones? If you were to just highlight a couple of the major questions. But the fact that she was found where she was found, so far away from where she was allegedly released, I have absolutely no idea how a girl who after my own heart, not a real big hiker and lover of the outdoors. I love the outdoors if I can see it through a beautiful window. Don't really care to go out in it. And she, it's like, it's like she is, you know, related to me and that we both don't really like hiking. She wasn't dressed for an 11 mile hike in the dark down a canyon. Um, she wasn't aware of the, um, of where she was. She wasn't used to the terrain and somehow within a short period of time, she ended up in an area that was um, unexplainable in my mind. So talk to me about like what some of the other question marks you have about like, um, you know, people bring up how her body was found, where it was found, that it wasn't fully found. 
um, what that may point to. So the fact that part of her body was found one way, another part of her body was found, I, I'm, I hesitate to use the word posed, but I don't know any other way part of her body, the major part of her body was posed in my mind, the way it was found, um, which could have been from a perpetrator. Um, the all important, most of her bones were found. The all important hyoid bone not found. So we don't know if she was strangled. We don't know how she died. That's, there's no, you know, outward sign. And the thing that's, that's easiest to, to, um, hide is str strangulation. It would seem like that would be, if someone were to have done something to her, that seems like it would have been the thing that they would have done as opposed to use a weapon, which would have absolutely shown she was murdered. So it's just, there's too many questions for me to say, uh, my trees walked a very long way, laid down in an area that she could have, it would have been so hard for her to get to, and then just succumb to the elements. It's just, there's too much too many other questions for me to just accept that and swallow it. So the questions are mounting, and then there's a new twist in this case that changes everything. Ford Sheriff's deputies removed Mitrice Richardson's remains without permission. He said, unfortunately, the sheriff botched up your daughter's investigation by removing the remains. And her remains are removed without the permission of the coroner, correct? So what happens is that the coroners were alerted to the fact that her remains um, were there, or that somebody's remains, they, were, they weren't saying that they were my Teresa's remains, um, but they initially were dropped into the wrong uh, location. So when they were dropped into the wrong, wrong location, there was just some confusion going on as to why that occurred. And so um, the coroners essentially said, okay, just we'll get there, don't don't move anything, but the the detectives actually did remove remove the remains against the orders of the coroner. How has that hurt the investigation? Because we we don't know what we don't know how she died. Right. So basically, they just scooped her body up. She, she was you know partially mummified and unclothed. So they scooped her body up and put it in the body bag. And the clothing that they assumed were hers, they were further down the stream, they picked those clothing up and they put that um, in the body, body bag also, presumably to be, you know, um, an autopsy or, you know, forensic examination to occur. The coroner's chief investigator, Craig Harvey. I'm not going to say no harm, no foul, but at this point we don't have any, any indication that the final findings, as which, as you know, are undetermined, would have changed. So what um, wasn't found? All of her body parts were not found. And how is that critical? Hi, friends. We are Carl and Joanne. And our podcast is Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. In our lighthearted podcasts, we share our unique ability to find humor in our marriage, adventures, and everyday life. Everything from crashing cars. Practical jokes. Unique blend of sarcasm. Joanne's ADHD. Carl's ability to be annoyed and entertained at the same time. If you need a little laughter and want to have some fun. Find us on Apple. Spotify and anywhere else you upload your podcasts. We are also on YouTube. Just search Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. So what happened is that when her, it, it was, it was discovered um, that not all of her, her remains were found. And so the coroners had to actually go in a couple, a couple of times to get additional bones. And so finger bones and various bones were missing. Um, currently, the biggest concern is the hyoid, hyoid bone is missing. That has never been found, or at least to our awareness, it's not been found. And so what the independent um, anthropologist, forensic anthropologist that kind of volunteered to work with uh, my teacher's family, said that that bone is critical because that could... Um, indicate if there was strangulation or something that have, that could have gone on. So that area of, of her neck is missing. So. so the clothing, that was later discovered inside with her body when it was buried, right? Um, mm -hmm. Talk me through why her remains were exhumed and how that was discovered. 
So, so what happened was when we, um, at some point during the search efforts, and we met the forensic anthropologist Clea Koff, and um, we, you know, I just asked her when I don't trust law enforcement at this point with regards to the handling of her bodies because of so many missteps. Um, and so if her body is ever found, would she be willing to come in and do an independent evaluation? And she agreed. So when my Teresa's body was found, actually, uh, Ms. Croft was in England, but she flew out on the day of the funeral. So like maybe just a few hours before the funeral, uh, the uh, funeral home allowed her to do, you know, an examination. And so she calls me frantically. She opens up the body bag and the clothing are inside the body bag to be buried on that day. So had we not had that forensic anthropologist there, we would have never known that the clothing were inside the body, never having gone to the crime lab. She had to make a quick decision. So the decision was, we're just going to have to zip everything up and, and we're just going to have to have her buried and then have the body exhumed. Because also, in addition to the clothing, she could tell that there was not a complete and thorough evaluation um, done of my trees. So were the clothing ever, ever examined? Um, the clothing, eventually, yes. When the, when On the day that her body was exhumed, we um, informed um, the detective in the case that we knew where the clothing were, and we would take them um, to get the clothing on the day that the body was exhumed, so that there wouldn't be any mishaps. So that it was take. We were there, um, and we were taken to the crime lab, and then the body supposedly, or, I'm sorry, the, the um, clothing supposedly uh, was examined. I say that because I don't. You know, there's no reason for me to trust the process at this point. And just because they said it was examined, I don't know if it wasn't or not. I know that her body wasn't, and I only know that because we had a secondary opinion. But as far as the clothing goes, we, all we can do is trust the word, you know, of the of the uh, evaluation team. And the secondary opinion, did that prove anything? All that person was really allowed to do was oversee the process to make sure that the process uh occurred in the way that it, it should. So in my opinion, it, it wasn't like the it, the examiner got to go in and do his own um, examination of her. He got to kind of observe what went on. So we're approaching 10 years with this case. Yes. What are the unanswered questions and why? Um, how she died, how she got to Montanito, who encountered her um, after she left that station or who may have encountered her after she left the station, where the rest of her clothing are, where, her, where the articles that she had, her paperwork um, that she had with her, where's that? Um, why won't to this day um, they release the video of her while she was in jail? They still refuse to do it, even though the, short, the sheriff has ordered that that, that video be released. Um, why nobody got punished for for the wrongdoing, the things that we know they did wrong. It is illegal to remove a body, period. And they did. So why, you know, what, what, what's, you know, why all the secrecy, secrecy around her case? Why the captain of the station who removed the video of my trees, hid it in his desk for four months, lied about it publicly, why, instead of getting fired or punished in any way, he got promoted? From your point of view, where's your investigation into these questions? So, uh, so far, what, or the last I've heard from the detective is that my Teresa's case is a clue-driven case, which basically means, to me, we sit on our ass until the clues come to us. Um, I am working very cr uh, closely with the new sheriff that we have, Alex Villanueva, who has, you know made a verbal commitment to me that he um, um, that he would look into my Teresa's case, that he is concerned that, that um, her case was not handled correctly. He's had some legal challenges with regards to getting a panel of experts together to be able to, to investigate that and actually is having to go to court in a couple of weeks to kind of, I don't know why you need to go to court to fight for the rights to do to, uh, for justice, but he does have to go because the County Board of Supervisors is not happy with him putting a panel together that could help in my Teresa's case as well as other cases. Um, I do believe in his commitment to my Teresa's case, so some of it is just being a little bit more patient, but um, 
It's not easy. Maitrice's parents take the case to court and they're awarded $900,000 in a wrongful death civil suit against the county and the sheriff's office. But that's not the end of it. Because the new sheriff, Alex Villanueva, tells Rhonda and a couple others while he's running for office that he plans to look at a few cases, including Maitrice's, and get some answers. Here he is talking about it. The Maitrice case in particular has already been adjudicated civilly on the lawsuit side. But there's still a lot of questions that are unanswered that people need to know the answers for. There are a lot of questions that people have the right to know the answer to. You know, Maitrice's story is devastating on so many levels. The care that she didn't get from beginning to end, and even the disrespect for her in her death. You know, see, those, that's haunting. So as far as closure goes, I'm not sure if that's something that I personally will ever have. Um, but she deserves justice. Do you think that she was murdered? You know, it just depends on the day. That it depends. Today, when you ask me that today, I believe today, I believe that it's the greatest possibility that an officer assaulted her and either directly is responsible for her death or is fully aware of who killed her. How do you want her to be remembered? It was just really a good um, experience to be in the presence of someone who was, you know, this up-and-coming psychologist. My dream was very smart. Um, and then, you know, but very sometimes very innocent and very naive about some things. Um, there was a goodness about her that she oftentimes, I think, assumed that other people shared that. So I think sometimes that may have gotten her uh, into a little trouble or, you know, kind of shocked. <laughs> you know, that how could people, how could people be so cruel? Um, I think she was always surprised by that. And a thank you to Rhonda and Maitrice's family and friends for talking about Maitrice and opening up about this case on multiple occasions. And thank you. Thank you for listening. This is a labor of love. And a special shout out to Paul Foss, Shannon Ransom, Sandy Bannister, Erica Wolotko, and Laura Labar. Thank you for your notes and for your reviews. So please subscribe, tell a friend, write a review. You might just get a shout out unless your review is horrible. (laughs) But kidding aside, reviews and subscribing, very critical, especially the first few weeks of a podcast to help it get noticed. So thank you. Investigators, until next time. Thank you for investigating True Crime Deadline with Matt Johnson. For more information about the podcast, visit truecrimedeadline.com. And remember, all tips regarding a case should go to the police. Until next time. Mr. Gatsby, want a cookie? Good boy.